Um, hi everyone, I think everyone knows me, but for those who don't, my name is Lexi. I'm the curator at the One Archives at USC Libraries. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's really my honor to introduce and serve as moderator on this great panel, several artists and scholars. We hope you've had a chance to see the film, um, which opened on Earth Day, opened virtually because the times we're in. And if you haven't seen it yet or you want to see it again, it will be up until May 9th. So please check that out on the One Archives website. We can also put a link in the chat. So we put together today's panel as a bit of a behind the scenes on this new work by Jordan and Coco, as well as a place to use the film as a jumping off point into larger discussions around ideas about land use, futurity, queerness, ecology, and many, many more that we'll get into. And we've invited Martabell and Aaron, two scholars, to join us for this part. Um, and in fact, I was just re reflecting and putting together comments for today about when Jordan first approached me about doing the exhibition and the program, that it was right around the time of the Texas um, extreme weather and blackouts. And so though this film is much more about fire, it really felt apt um, about kind of each different natural slash man-made disaster coming to the fore that we have felt as well as of course the pandemic and everything we're going through. So hopefully this will resonate in, in lots of ways, our discussion. And so I know that the panel will take up questions that the film asks around kind of the power of the feminine, how we work to toward a more equal society, how we care for the earth, how we build relationships based on mutual aid, how we care for um, our environment, and as well as thinking about kind of associations with Jane Eyre, um, the dual destructive and cleansing natures of fires, so on and so forth. So just a little bit of housekeeping an overview, how this panel is gonna go is that we're going to have an introduction from Jordan and Coco about the film, then, Martabell and then Aaron will both reflect on the film and bring in other elements from their scholarship and life. Uh, we'll have a kind of discussion and we'll happily take questions as well from the audience. Um, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. If you'd like closed captioning, um, I will make that available at this moment. If you like that, you can put the CC, but push the CC button on the bottom of your screen and it should appear. Um, we encourage you to turn on your video, but you don't have to. It's just nice to see everyone together in one virtual space. And we are recording the conversation and we will make that available later. So as a way to kick things off, I'll just read some short bios of our artists and panelists. Coco Klockner is an artist and writer in New York City. Their studio practice uses sculpture, video, and text to address the circulation of ideology through its varied hosts, material, culture, media, and bodies. Jordan Lepke Klesnik is an artist from Montreal living in Los Angeles. They work in video, sculpture, and installation, creating experiences that tell stories about ecological survival, the queer body, personal relationships, and sense of place. Aaron Katzman is currently a PhD student in visual studies with an emphasis in global studies at the University of California, Irvine. He received his BA in art history with a certificate in environmental studies from University of Hawaii, Manoa. Aaron's research lies at the intersection of contemporary art, political ecology, and decolonial geographies with a particular focus on the visual culture of land struggles. He is co-chair of the Environmental Humanities Research Cluster at UCI, co-organizer of the Climate Futures Collective Study Group, and is working as a curatorial research assistant with the Orange County Museum of Art for their participation in the 2024 Getty Pacific Standard Time Art Time Science Times LA exhibition. Martabelle Wasserman is a PhD student in art, art history at Stanford University. She received her BA from Harvard University and MFA from University of California, Irvine. She has an interdisciplinary practice at the intersections of art, activism, and academic research. She has written about Fierce Pussy, The AIDS Crisis, The Aesthetics of Solidarity, and Feminist Art and Environmentalism. Curatorial projects include Fire in Her Belly, Hold Up, and Coastal Border. She has ex exhibited at Gracie Mansion Gallery in New York, Human Resources in Los Angeles, and the Museum of Art and History at Santa Cruz. So please join me in welcoming this great panel and Jordan and Coco, take it away. Thank you, Lexi. Um, 
Kokoro and I discussed, I'm going to give a kind of background on how this work came to be and and then they're going to talk deeper. They're going to delve a little bit deeper. Um, thanks everyone for coming. This is going to be really fun. We have like a nice intimate group. We can really, you know, chat, um, you know, open up a little bit. So yeah, we're here because of this video work that Coco and I made that is being screened uh, by the One Archives online until next Sunday, the 9th. And so, you know, I'm going to talk a bit about the work and I'm really excited to hear from Marta Bell and Aaron. They're more, um, you know, much smarter than, than us and I think have very exciting things to talk to us about, which I'm really excited to learn from them. So just before I start, there's going to be spoilers um, in this about the story of Jane Eyre and also a novel by Jean Rhys called Wide Sargasso Sea. So if you haven't read these books, I'm really sorry, but there's no choice. I have to spoil them because all the most poignant, juicy details are what was really contributing to this work. Um, so Jane Eyre, Los Angeles, it's a nine minute video work that we made. And it kind of began when I, the start of the pandemic, you know, classic COVID artist story, you know, I was cooped up in my home and there had always been this kind of weird piece of plywood screwed to the ceiling of my closet. And I was like, what's, what's through the, the plywood? Like what's there? Um, so I, you know, got a ladder and I took down the plywood and I went up into my attic and I was just looking at it and started thinking about Jane Eyre, which is a novel that I love. Um, and if anyone doesn't know about the story of Jane Eyre, very, very briefly, it was written in 1867, uh, 1847. It was published in 1847 by Charlotte Bronte under a pseudonym. And it's basically the story of a young woman who comes to be a governess or take, over, take care of the children of this rich man in this kind of moody, freaky mansion in the moors of England. And there's these kind of strange events at the manor house and eventually the manor house burns down and it's this horrible disaster and the kind of anti-hero of, well, what, what I consider an anti-hero or hero of the story is this woman named Antoinette who is, the, the, the Lord of the house, it's his, his wife that he has kept secret, who is, um, according to him, severely mentally ill, and she's kind of confined to the attic. And then at the end of the novel, she burns down the manor house and kind of destroys everything. Um, so that's the kind of central metaphor that I started thinking about in relation to the continual fire seasons in Los Angeles, in Southern California, and now all up and down the West Coast in Australia. I started connecting um, you know, my little attic and the story of Jane Eyre in it being this like very quintessentially misogynistic plot about a woman who burns everything down through her kind of out of control psyche, this very classic misogynistic kind of idea. And um, in the 20th century, this like kind of feminist writer named Jean Rhys wrote the backstory of Antoinette, who is the woman in the attic who burns down the house and ties in this amazing kind of, kind of reimagines who was Antoinette. And in her retelling, Antoinette is a mixed race uh, heiress of a, who marries into a colonial landowning family in Jamaica and through revolution is, sent back to England with her husband who treats her horribly and locks her in the attic and tells her you're mentally ill. And, but she really brings in these really interesting kind of very specifically anti-colonial in like a reimagining of the story of Jane Eyre. So what was really in interesting for me in all of these metaphors was the idea of like the feminine in these stories being this kind of destruct perceived as a destructive force but also you know she's burning down this rich guy's house and kind of um for me it really connected to the wildfires in southern california particularly in areas like malibu being a result of you know settler 
people building where they shouldn't be, using the land in a way they shouldn't be, and then the land kind of like fighting back and being like, okay, well, we're just going to burn everything down because you shouldn't be living here anyways. You know, like this is a place that is, that burns every year. That's like part of its natural life cycle. Um, so that was kind of the progression. And in the video work, it it's told through a very kind of interior uh, narrative, narrative method, which also really connects to the story of Jane Eyre, the way Jane Eyre was written, um, which was interesting to me when I was doing research on Jane Eyre, I learned that it was kind of the first time that a first person, very like very first person perspective in a novel kind of showed the progression of someone's like personal, you know, kind of a Bill Roman self evolution. And in Jane Eyre, there's very like conservative Christian undertones, but that was the first time this kind of first person perspective had been used in, in, a, in a novel in that way and kind of revolutionized fiction. Um, and that's a method that I'm really interested in in my own work, like shooting in a first person perspective, shooting like even, you know, from the eye view of a character. So yeah, that's a background on Jane Eyre and why it's Sargasso Sea. And I think I will now pass over to Coco. Thanks, thanks Jordan. Um, yeah, so I feel like having that background sort of sets the stage to understand like certain ways that um, like rage and femininity get um, placed as like mutually exclusive from, from each other all the time. Um, uh, so working with the actress, um, Hazel, I think we start to see in the way that we've constructed it, like a sort of like Ouroboric, like swirling way of using metaphors in which um, a lot of these like structures of power are overlaying onto uh, one another um, where what Jordan said about Malibu of understanding like this is a place that naturally burns, it builds up a lot of energy that needs to exhaust, um, that that like comes into conflict with the way that class overlays over that, that piece of land um, and the way that um, um, just understanding like the way that these things sort of overlay onto each other um, becomes problematic. So, um, the aspect there's there's this aspect that our, our like central subject is this trans woman, um, and I think one of the things that that drew me to Jordan's initial uh, proposal about this piece and and introducing me to the the attic space was like thinking about the ways that um, certain emotions and affects become dysphoric because of the way that they um, get essentialized as like gendered positions. Um, and we were, we were both locking on to a certain short story that, uh, that we were reading in the summer in which this, the writer, um, whose name is escaping me was just talking about the way that she was suddenly being introduced. She was a cis woman and was being introduced to her own rage for the first time. Um, and the way that that felt really liberating. Um, and she was just making her realize all this time that she had been forcing herself to do certain things and, you know, be, um, even if they were like minor, minor moments, um, say like, oh, don't react in a certain way, like just understand how to be a mediator for everything. So this liberation aspect of like what rage could do to her, that was a really exciting moment for, for me and for like thinking about the, the way that Hazel was, um, acting as this character in that um, when emotions become dysphoric and essentialized as male, that like moments where you can break those um, and where rage can feel really like affirming as a certain like gender euphoric position, um, that feels like something really uh, uh, fruitful of the way of that uh, Hazel acts this this sort of constructed character for this story that we've made. 
and I think also like overlays onto the way that like a lot of us and or that that more and more it's becoming apparent of just um, working without a, a stabilized system of control burns and like expecting places like Malibu to not be burning regularly is um, just not sustainable. So um, there's an exciting aspect to me of the way that this story. Uh, it, it gets really blurry and um, while also staying anchored to this like really specific concrete anchor point of Jane Eyre as this like jumping off point. Um, yeah, I think that's what I have to contribute there. I forgot to show some stills. So maybe I'll leave your audio on and I'll show some stills and um, we can maybe keep chatting a little bit as I show them. Mm -hmm. I was thinking earlier about I wanted about what I wanted to say, and like just thinking about what you were saying just now, I feel like it also became kind of a metaphor for me about, and this is like extremely literal, but um, so I'm just gonna click through some of these stills from the from the video work as I talk. Um, it kind of became this very very literal metaphor for like. So in Jane Eyre, in the story of Jane Eyre, um, you know, this kind of very, you know, out of control, like this woman who like burns everything down, um, you know, what she's burning down is this, you know, kind of vestige of power, this like manor house, um, kind of a symbol for patriarchy or something, like I'm being very literal right now. Um, and so for me, it kind of felt like femininity in a more broader sense as this kind of, um, in the context of like non-binary femininity, it can be a way to, you know, tear down the like masculine or something, you know what I mean? This is that's part of the metaphor. I was, I don't know, how do you feel about that, Coco? <laughs> that, it's um, like, that's very literal, but I kind of love it as, as well. Wait, sorry, can you say that last sentence one more time? Oh, just like fem like non-binary femininity, like the feminine being a way of like um, embodying and, and expressing and using as a way to kind of unlearn or like take apart like patriarchal thinking and structures and how we relate to each other and how we conceive of ourselves or what even what we consider to be masculine or feminine or something. Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the exciting things about, um, I mean, I should probably preface this a little bit too, to say that uh, I think Jordan's and my background are both like, kind of have starting, like Jordan has a, has a longer background in video than I do, but we, we both have um, worked in sculptural settings um, before this. So I feel like, there are certain aspects of indulgence that I think become really important about that, the way that like uh, working in any art practice, but I, I also think like working in space and, and sculpture also sort of allows it even more so than like film at times. Um, but I think like the way that we've collaborated on this project, it like for me, it feels very much like a, a stemming of the way that you and I both work in space. Um, which I only say to preface that I think like uh, the way that like, I think we're being fluid with the notion of power is something that I think is like an, an, an indulgent way of talking about power that I think is still like really fruitful and like helps me understand certain, certain things. It's like, there are conflations happening in which we're able to like draw connections of like a distilled idea of power um, in like class and, and gender um, and energy um, in ways that like, I'm not totally necessarily sure that if we were writing an essay about it that I would feel comfortable to like stand by like all this sort of like loose ways of pinning one thing to another. But I think in the way that they get sort of like filtered through, um, yeah, like understanding what trans feminine rage looks like and what um, what like control burns look like and what, um, um, I don't know, like in, indulging 
just more broadly within this sort of set of structures that uh, we're working within um, the way they sort of like yield sideways answers to to problems that uh, don't always have like straightforward answers. I think it can also, you know, when you mentioned that it's like in our in the video, like Antoinette, or, you know, who's played by Hazel is kind of like, she's like walk, she's like moving through the landscape that is like burning, you know, in the process of burning, which is like, for me, it was kind of like turning on its head this like classic trope of like the landscape being like from a male gaze being like the body of a woman or something like in so many films, that's how it's perceived. Um, so it's kind of like she's kind of like the ghost like appearing or something in in that trope. But. We want to now maybe this is really great start and open up to the conversation. I think maybe now we should bring in um, Marta Bell and then Aaron and I think we'll come back to a lot of these themes and topics and I have some more questions around medium and other things prepared if we if time allows as well. How's that sound? Maribel, you want to share your, are you sharing your screen? I think you have to give me permission. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, Lexi and Jordan, Coco and Aaron and all the friendly faces here. It's really nice to be able to talk about these issues together. Um, and I am very happy to think in this small group together. So this film was made in September 2020. And I can't help but think of the summer of 2020 as being bookended by fire. On the one hand, the uprisings um, because of the police murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and countless others. And on the other hand, this really extended, prolonged and extensive California fire season, like the worst we've seen. So we can understand the film as like emerging out of this context. Um, so I don't think we can talk about LA and fire without talking about the Watts Rebellion. So I wanted to start there. And I also wanna kind of bring up Mike Davis and his essay, Let Malibu Burn, and recommend his other books at the Night on Fire, LA in the 60s, and sort of recommend him as the patron saint of this event for someone to think through these ideas of, of LA and fire with. Um, so this was the rallying cry of the 1965 Watts rebellions, and it came from a DJ named Magnificent Montauk, who used this as his phrase um, when he was spinning, burn, baby, burn. So the disco song, et cetera, came after. Um, and the thing about the Watts Rebellion, which again emerged from a, an instance of police brutality um, in which someone was pulled over and uh, failed a sobriety test, but then was met with very aggressive police force, um, and, as well as his brother and his mother. And he was about a block away from home and it, it kicked off you know, many, many days of riots. And it's often called um, the Watts riots or Watts Rebellion, there's like a, a shift in language that kind of lets us into the perspective of, of how people are thinking about fire and rebellion and riots as either productive or destructive or somewhere in the middle. And I was thinking a lot about that in relation to this video. So thinking about the generative power of fire and the Watts Rebellion, I wanted to bring in Noah Purfoy, whose practice really emerged quite literally out of the Watts Rebellion, um, as we can see with like this type of artifact where he found pieces of, of Watts, um, what remained of Watts and showed them in this exhibition, 66 Signs of Neon. Um, so there's like this emergence of a junk data aesthetic that came out of the ashes of the Watts Rebellion. And I thought of this image as well, Sir Watts II from 1996 in relation to the in Jane Eyre in LA and thinking about 
post-apocalyptic tools of survival, making uh, avatars and costumes and aesthetics out of the remains as sort of another form of resistance. I also wanted to highlight the theme of queer evolution in relation to this, um, the theme of like the productive power of fire. And I was really struck by this sentence, um, animals adapted with century hooves that could chip away uh, the glass. And I, I'm thinking a lot about um, an LA based writer named Sam Cohen who writes a lot about queer evolution. I really recommend her work. But I also couldn't help but think of the Watts Towers as a form of, of rebellion where there is like literally glass, like chips of things that have been discarded that evolved into this iconic centerpiece of like South LA. Um, and this, I wanted to like highlight that, that resonance. And again, just a close up and I, I'm just like hearing the glass as it's being described in the video, hooves of glass and this kind of junk art. Um, so this is obviously a short presentation, so I don't, I can't go into the extensive history of like LA riots, which I think is really important for understanding this kind of work, but I just wanted to bring up the 1992 LA riots after the, um, Rodney King beating and the, the echo of burn baby burn as a reoccurring theme. Um, this is an image from 92. And then here we are again in 2020, a police car on fire in LA. So I, so I started um, my presentation talking about the kind of dual crises of police brutality and runaway capitalism, environmental destruction. And um, the people who are here who I've thought with a lot have probably heard me talk about this quote and some of the images I'm gonna share because they've really been um, inspiring my thinking this past year. But I wanted to bring in this quote from Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, where she says, abolition has to be green and highlight the idea that um, in order to imagine the end of carceral capitalism, we're also, we also have to imagine like a bio-flourishing future, something, these things are intertwined. And I think fire really gives us a way to think about that as does the film. Oops. So this project is at UCSC um, by Jackie Samoa and a prisoner uh, wrongly accused, not that it necessarily matters, named Timothy Young and solitary confinement. He's on death row. And this is um, a collaborative project where he communicated with Jackie the types of plants he wanted to have planted at the UCSC campus. Um, and there's a recreation in concrete of his, his cell. Um, and the prompt of this kind of this project that's an ongoing series of collaborations, the Solitary Garden is helping us to like imagine a world without prisons, um, a landscape without prisons. And I think ecology is a really important lens through which to do so. Um, I've talked about this image a lot in the past year by an MFA student at Stanford named Gregory Rick. Um, I was just so struck by this. He made it right after the third precinct burned. And there's these images of birds and jellyfish and flamingos in the background and Thoreau coming out of a helicopter. And I think this really <laughs> gets to what I'm getting at where these two things have to be thought of together, which again, the video shows us. Um, and there's the regenerative power of burns, which we know from indigenous land management practices. And I wanted to bring in this image from Big Basin, which is California's oldest national park, which burned um, pretty, uh, yeah, pretty much burned down completely this past summer. And there's something about the reproductive process of redwoods where they are able to like, the seeds are able to open through fire or um, uh, clones are able to shoot up after a traumatic event that is a kind of resistance to capitalism extractive practices in its own way. I mean, to an extent. And when we're talking about fire being good and bad and generative and destructive, I also want to highlight the like the horrendous, horrendous experience so many humans and non-humans had this summer with the air quality being what it was with, um, you know, people who are houseless, that the just devastation to plants and animals is not, 
it's important to highlight that while also thinking about the regenerative power of fire and the um, tremendous resistance of um, of the of the natural environment. So this is a redwood that's reemerging after this fire. And this, um, many of my friends have seen before, is my favorite meme of 2020, <laughs> in which, uh, as many of you know, there was this sort of trope that because of COVID, with the decrease in travel and um, you know, flying, driving, et cetera, that the earth was starting to heal itself, that there were dolphins returning to the Venice Canal as if like a temporary slowdown, which really wasn't slow enough, as we all know, for frontline and essential workers um, could, could undo this damage. But I think that this riff on that meme where we actually see a police car on fire gets at the core of this idea of abolition ecology, where we have to think these things together. Um, and the film really resonates with, with many of these things that uh, this season of, of fire has brought up for me and many of my friends and collaborators. So thank you. And I will stop share. Thanks, Maribel, so, so good. Um, so many things to think through, which I know we will discuss, but let's, we'll hear from Aaron and then we'll, we'll have a conversation. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for your comments so far. <clears throat> I wanted to thank uh, Lexi for the invitation. Um, I also want to thank Jordan and Coco for just uh, trusting me to think about and talk about your work. Um, and also Martabel for being kind of in, dis in dialogue and in discussion with me about some of these ideas in the past. Um, I think hopefully Martabel and I's uh, talks kind of complement each other. Mine's a little uh, less art based, a little more theoretical, a little bit more speculative. Um, but before I even begin, um, I wanna just point out a few things that came to mind when Martabel was speaking um, that might be of interest to some people. Um, uh, this idea of abolition ecologies is one that is uh, kind of rapidly picking up steam. Um, and I believe that there is a either just released or soon to be released issue of Antipode Journal, um, which is a geography journal um, on this issue of abolition ecology. So if anyone's interested in that, definitely check that out. Um, also, I love that meme. Uh, and I, am, I follow a geographer on social media who's who's a scholar whose name is uh, Kai Bosworth. And I know he has an essay coming out on these nature is healing memes that proliferated during the pandemic. Uh, so his name is Kai Bosworth, if anyone wants to keep an eye out for that. Um, and lastly, I think that the idea of abolition and decolonization kind of being inherently linked is uh, an important uh, topic that I will end with. So just uh, something to keep in mind as I go. I came to Irvine to attend grad school here on August 9th, 2018. After landing at LAX the day before and, sta and staying with my sister in Los Angeles, my drive down the 405 was greeted by two staple experiences of living in Southern California, traffic and a hazily gorgeous sunset. As my partner and I sat in our car and stop and go traffic for what felt like hours, contributing, contributing our own small bit of pollution to the air, the sky slowly morphed into something unlike anything I'd ever seen before. As it so happened, our arrival to Irvine coincided with the Holy Fire in the Santa Ana Range, the mountains that stretch along the eastern edge of Orange County and largely separate it from neighboring Riverside County. Within the first 24 hours, Within my first 24 hours in Southern California, I'd already encountered the planned and unplanned ecological complexities of the region in the form of highways and the threat of wildfires, both incessantly wrapping over and through the land and in one way or another, coloring the skies with their chemical outputs. Fast forward to October, 2020, when I was awoken in the middle of the night by the smell of smoke and ash coming through our screen windows, a result of the nearby Silverado fire at the mouth of a canyon in the Santa Ana Mountains. And here's just a, a map of that. And 
uh, UC Irvine's campus is right, if I'm correct, right about here. So kind of right in the path of the fire. Given the increasing prevalence of these wildfires up and down California, Oregon, and Washington, it might be apt to consider fire as a specter that is haunting the West Coast. Such a statement ultimately deems the question, to what or whom exactly are these uncontrollable wildfires haunting? In their video work, Jane Eyre, Los Angeles, Jordan and Coco reminisce on a similarly intimate relationship to the wildfires of Southern California, like the ones I just detailed. Moreover, their video is, a, is additionally critical and explorative of gender and sexual norms, and thus, I believe, about the histories of settler colonialism in what is now the Los Angeles metropolitan area, which is primarily the unceded ancestral homelands of the Tongva people. As such, the film provides a starting point to consider the overlap between queer ecology and decolonization of lands, peoples, and the relations between the two. Before I expand on that, though, allow me to quickly summarize the work from my own perspective. I will briefly reference a few resources in the process, so please feel free to ask for more details in the chat or afterward uh, if any catch your attention. And while, while I am by no means an expert of queer ecological thought, I hope my brief insights will serve as a potential point of departure for further conversation. Jane Eyre Los Angeles offers a personal reflective response to the fires that burn within oneself as expressed through a physical relation to Southern California wildfires in 2020. The film begins with a futuristic, sinister, dystopic, and almost Blade Runner-esque soundtrack before almost immediately cutting to a personal conversation about the experience of rage. Who or what is allowed to be rageful? Perhaps the unasked question here is, who should we rage against? An inquiry partially answered by the end of the video. Following these opening scenes, the film continues with hazy scenes of the Malibu coastline, aided by dreamy shots of water. Water continually acts as a place of refuge in the film, yet it is never physically engaged despite its seeming proximity. There's reference to the smashing of a dam, which for me evokes the history of Los Angeles's water wars, in particular the breaking of St. Francis Dam, which essentially ended the career of William Mulholland, the man largely responsible for LA's growth. We are met with mul multiple montages of the fiery sky juxtaposed with an unnamed hand holding a candle, possibly understood as a symbol of control, of being in charge of one's destiny, an arsonist if so desired. There's a lingering tension between what one can control and what one cannot. The power of the film rests in its uncelebratory and accepting demeanor. This fire, despite its destructive capabilities, is not spectacular. We can't stop it burning and I don't think I want it to, the narr narrator tells us, continuing to describe the fire. It isn't good or bad, it just is. In this way, the film counters the otherwise spectacular images of wildfires and thus their inherent aestheticization as described by TJ Damos in his E-Flux essay titled, The Agency of Fire, Burning Aesthetics. While Damos claims that popular fire images are situated in a media ecology of denial, Jane Eyre Los Angeles wrestles not with a sense of denial, but with a sense of being with from the personal feelings of one's insides burning to daily anxieties, an incendiary act of staying with the trouble, to cite Donna Haraway. In this way, I found the film to be a gendered critique of Los Angeles's most notable art tendencies of the past, such as light and space and Finnish fetish, which, seeming, which seemingly basked in a cishet macho manner in the glory of what art historian James Nisbet has deemed the polluted image of LA's skies. In this example from the notorious Ferris Gallery, an explanation for a group exhibition reads, quote, a 1964 exhibition, reads, quote, the Ferris group self-consciously characterized themselves as masculine and hardworking, a stance that would reach its apotheosis in 1964 when Ed Moses, Ken Price, Billy Al Bengston, and Robert Irwin took part in a group show brazenly called The Studs. The exhibition poster, which incorporated an illustration of a pioneer unloading lumber from a horse-drawn cart, 
aligned the artists with the resourceful and laboring frontiersmen, end quote. In Jane Eyre, Los Angeles, however, there is no aspect of overt control, only tacit acceptance. Furthermore, there's a sense of yearning present in the film, such as when the narrator approaches a ravine and searches for the right name to call it. The film even elicits a yearning for fire itself, or what the narrator describes as the ultimate cleanser for an unnamed rotten system, with fire lighting the way to a place where relationships are based on aid rather than domination. If this were indeed the case, the film leaves us to ultimately ponder why is fire so closely associated with hell. In their introduction to the edited volume, Queer Ecology, Sex, Nature, Politics, Desire, Catriona Mortimer Sandilands and Bruce Erickson describe the task of queer ecology as, among other things, developing, quote, an environmental politics that demonstrates an understanding of the ways in which sexual relations organize, I would include gender as well, organize and influence both the material world of nature and our perceptions, experiences, and constitutions of that world, end quote. They highlight the longstanding ways in which white men in particular, quote, came to assert their increasingly heterosexual identities in the wilderness, explicitly against the urban specter of the queer, end quote. What to make then of the conjuncture of nature and urban scenes in the film, both of which actually appear to be taken from the Santa Monica mountains, or at least some sort of park space on the outskirts of the city? While queer ecology might offer one approach to better understanding the film's effective qualities, I think it is insufficient for a queer ecological analysis must also consider how the very necessity for such an approach is a direct result of ongoing processes of settler colonialism. As Tongva and a Hashiman scholar Charles Sepulveda has detailed in his essay titled Our Sacred Waters, the Spanish process of subjugating indigenous land and sexual practices in the Los Angeles basin were inherently intertwined. Writing about the historical Monjerio system, which domesticated indigenous women into subservient roles in heteropatriarchal society, Sepulveda links this kind of settler logic to the more contemporary channelization and entombing of the Santa Ana River both of which are based in a forceful kind of submission and domination. Thus, when the narrator in Jane Eyre, Los Angeles speaks of these wildfires as the heart of an inferno of so many years, I think it is imperative that our timeline reaches further back than most to fully consider their often obscured root cause, for our eyes might take an equally long time to adjust. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Fantastic. Really, so much to discuss. Um, I have tons of questions. I'm sure those in the audience do as well. But first, I want to give either Jordan or Coco kind of a chance to respond to any of that that you want to or pick it out. And we can start somewhere and go everywhere else. Coco, should I talk? I mean, I think, first of all, as um, you know, as, as Aaron and Marta Bell pointed out, like, we're definitely not trying to glorify fire as like, oh, we need to burn everything down, you know? And like, that was really one of the other big inspirations I forgot to mention. What is Mike Davis? And his, as Marta Bell brought up, he is the patron saint of this work uh, and this talk and, you know, kind of all 2020 for me, he's kind of, I listened on audio to all of City of Courts, all of Ecology of Fear, two of his most amazing uh, collections of writing and, um, you know, the, 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 the desire to make this work is really to talk about how terrible, like, kind of the situation is, um, and to kind of tease out um, the complexities of it, um, you know, which also brings me to, you know, like, I'm not, as Coco said, like, if this was an essay, we wouldn't necessarily be defending every, you know, it's like, it's not an essay, it's, a, it's an artwork, which, and that's why, it, it allows us to kind of play within all of these kind of very tense, uh, you know, paradoxes that that is like Southern California and the fires. 
But yeah, and we're Margaret Bell and Aaron, those were both so fascinating. Um, I'm gonna be coming back to the recorded uh, video to, to go through what you said again, really interesting. Yeah, and just to piggyback on something that Jordan said, I, I think it is an important point to lean into that like not all fire is the same. Like I feel like some of the dialogue in the video uh, actually gets pretty granular about like what happens when by when fire burns too hot is that it like actually transforms the landscape in a way that it doesn't when it's when it's done in a, in a controlled and like working through through models of like land stewardship um yep okay so i'm going to follow up so with some more questions to tease out different elements, but for everyone else who's here, if you have a question, just pop in, unmute yourself in the chat um, because we're such a small group, or um, if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can also type your question or comments in the chat and I will happily read them aloud for you or you can then chime in. Um, but just, I'll go in no particular order because I have whole different things, but maybe to start, I think this question around medium is something that came up in all different kind of conversations, but Jordan and Coco both starting kind of more as making sculpture and now transition, and obviously also making film work, but kind of what the film afforded and where it doesn't afford so many things, especially, I think it's interesting, there's a lot of translation or transliteration going on from Jane Eyre um, and White Sargasses to see both as novels now into a film um, and thinking too about kind of Aaron Maribel, your, your presentations, even bringing up like memes and other kind of forms of what we wouldn't, or like widely named visual culture, but we wouldn't consider kind of art in, in the sense as such. But I guess the question is around kind of how to communicate on these topics. And in this case, you know, what film is able to do, but also, um, what other mediums are able to do and not do. And I think, you know, you're just struck by like the picture you have, which then you kind of narrate as your first day or second day going to Irvine um, and are kind of all personal experiences in some way or another with living in Southern California through one or more of these kind of fire episodes. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. This I, I kind of started thinking about this in my response, um, and just didn't want to get too far into it, too far into the weeds of like a academic essay and citing things. Um, but the the one essay I did reference by um, T J Demos um, in Eflux, um, he he's mainly speaking in that essay about the type of images, wildfires that we see on the news and that kind of go viral and the kind of uh, ways that those images um, almost become uh, uh, so saturated within the, the media landscape that they lose their, their kind of effective qualities, um, which is really interesting to think about um, in relation to this film, because I think that the film's strength is is its its blurriness, like uh, Jordan and Coco were saying at the, in their opening remarks. Its kind of ability to play with these different meanings and uh, relationship between the personal and the landscape, um, and I guess that is that's kind of it's it's an interesting medium that can come through montage uh, and collage and, and film. Um, but also through the first person narrative, which is an interesting kind of, I guess it's a medium, I'm not sure what the correct term is, uh, genre that carries over, you know, from John, Jane Eyre to the film itself. Yeah, the other genre I'll just throw in because Aaron, your remarks are making me think about it. It's like either whatever you want to call it, science fiction, magical realism, fantasy with the kind of puffs and things and how the line, I mean, very much the productivity of blurring the line between the real and the not real. And in some ways, the kind of magical realism or the science fiction is more real or more apt than the kind of journalistic news images or something that we get so bombarded with that no longer kind of carry any of the weight that we actually want them to convey.
Um, not to not to hog the conversation, but I guess when you were just uh, saying something about like the dystopic, it it reminded me of um, the 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 really quick kind of reference I made to Blade Runner and like the opening music, the opening score. Um, it has like this futuristic, dystopian feel to it, and yet at the same time, it's the film is still so rooted in like the personal and the intimate. Um, and I think it, the film does a really good job of, of, again, just kind of blurring those two distinct type of like uh, effective modes of thinking through this type of scene. Um, and that kind of leads me to one question that I have and it's the, about the film and it's the scenes of this, the cityscape where it doesn't necessarily, um, you wouldn't necessarily, if you were just to see those stills of the city, you wouldn't think that they're from um, a, a time when wildfires are happening. They kind of just look like, you know, a hazy uh, af dawn uh, or dusk, you know, city scene. And so I was, I was interested in asking the artists about you know, the kind of um, the use of the city scenes in the film and, and what you're trying to kind of get at with that beyond maybe just like the place uh, specificities of it. You want to feel that one, Karka? I can, I can, uh, I can get a starting point. I, I feel like I also have to illuminate a little bit of our, our process, which uh, I know is it was introduced that I'm in New York. So I, I have like a, in some ways a very different relationship with, with the fires. Um, I was realizing last time when, when the four of us um, were meeting that uh, um, like I, I understand that, uh, you know, I wasn't there when, when these, these shots were, were being done. Um, but I feel like the way that uh, the themes that we're like trying to understand about the a blurring between like interiority and exteriority in space um, is that like the proximity of all these things, um, they have like a really specific way of, of innate, uh, I don't know, of setting what the power dynamic is and understanding like precarity of um, when there is sort of power exchange within uh, within both of these settings, like interiority and exteriority. So, I mean, I think Jojo, you can probably t speak a little bit more to um, what the actual like cinematography was like and um, the sites that you all were shooting at. Yeah, we, we worked remotely on this, you know, Coco, contributing on the storyboard and, and screenwriting and animations and um, my kind of feet on the ground, you know, like shooting socially distanced outdoors, you know, with three people, me, the cinematographer, Adam Gundersheimer and, um, and Hazel, the actor. But yeah, like the way the day to day, yeah, like it's funny to have you point that out um, I admit I wasn't too critical about including those shots other than them contextualizing the work. Um, there was something tempting about it because um, if, you know, if, if this is magical realism, there's quite a lot of like realism in it. You know, there's a lot of just like, there's a shot of a street like in my neighborhood where I live and there's a shot of the coast in Malibu as shot from the hills, you know? So there was quite a lot of just like, here we are in this place. So I think for me, it was really like continually tying it back to like, we're in Los Angeles, we're in Los Angeles. And the same thing is with the title, you know, like why, why is it called Jane Eyre Los Angeles? It's a very like kind of, yeah, direct, just like tying the metaphor right in front of your face, like forcing them together, like in the comma, you know, it's almost like, Jane Eyre, is Jane Eyre in Los Angeles? Or like what they're, they're shooting a new version of, Los, of Jane Eyre in Los Angeles? It's kind of like this weird, so I feel like that that is the role of that footage for me. Um, you know, cause there's like, also it's it's kind of a palate cleanser be between these kind of heady, like deep 
you know, diaristic kind of narration segments or kind of fantastical, like, wait, what? Like the mountains are made of glass now? And then, and then you're just looking at a forest for a moment. Um, so a way of building and breathing room into, into the work, which I have to admit is a, is a challenge for me. Like I'm always like, I'm always editing things too tight and I have to actually let myself let them breathe. Like people often on my rough drafts, people are like, you need to like put some space between these subs, like this dialogue because it's too fast. Like, so that's me, um, you know, letting things breathe a bit, but yeah, I mean, that's really interesting to point that out. Yeah, I was also thinking about the title of Jane Eyre, Los Angeles, because it immediately pins it to a specific site. And it appears almost very shortly into the film, it burns in the skyline. So everyone's aware that we're looking at Los Angeles. And I'm really thankful to Marvel's presentation for taking the site specificity of Los Angeles and the fire burns and thinking alongside kind of the ongoing riots that have happened in LA that if you live in LA at all, or even if you've lived in the United States or even internationally, you know these names, the Watts riots, rebellions, um, and so on. And how I think it's um, Elizabeth Hoover in a symposium that Erin thankfully shared with all of us to watch. Um, she talks about how similarly the burns and the riots happen. You know, things are suppressed. They're not kind of burned as they should or kind of taken care of. And so they, they burn much hotter and stronger than, and, than if kind of systems and structures had been in place all along. And we see this, I mean, the summer of 2020 is a perfect example that kind of like all it took was a slight match being lit or, you know, one video from one police murder going viral and it ignited across the country. And so the similarity in the ways in which those two things kind of burn is also feels like so front and center, even though of course the riots part isn't pictured in the film, you feel it. I think kind of throughout. That's just not more, that's more of a comment than a direct question about just thinking through kind of, um, and then even just Jordan, when you were saying like your tendencies to edit things too tight, which is interesting too, because there's a way which like these, the burns are not controlling the land as a kind of um, editing too tight, right? Trying to suppress or trying to make this like the perfect kind of whatever, and then realizing, okay, we need space. We need to kind of, figuring out what the land needs or what the film needs or what the art needs. And we need to kind of, it's in dialogue rather than a kind of one way imposed um, conversation. I don't know, just more thoughts than um, direct questions there, but. Well, another thing that uh, Aaron's question made me think about was is kind of like the ultimate underlying politic of, of the work for me is like land back, like there should be indigenous oversight of these lands, like the nations that continue to live here should be profiting from the land, they should be controlling the conservation of the land. But ultimately the work is from a settler perspective about settlers in Los Angeles, which is like also for me, the, the use of the metaphor of Jane Eyre, it's very much like, you know, it's Charlotte Bronte, it's English literature, you know, it's, the, it's empire, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's very much about like, yeah, it's a settler perspective and um, yeah, you know, Antoinette is kind of our, our, um, our kind of figurehead for something, you know, related to that kind of, you know, dancing through the, the landscape for us. Definitely. And something else that came up and maybe this is more of a question. So I'm getting like the evening California sun is strong in here apparently. Um, is around naming. So thinking about Jane Eyre Los Angeles as a kind of naming and site specificity, but the power that I was thinking about too through Aaron and Martabelle, both of your presentations and how one really built on the other. First, Martabelle introducing ecology and abolition, and then the term abolition ecology comes to the fore. And Aaron, you're mentioning the upcoming journal, which is using that at its title and um, just kind of how powerful that naming can be in putting things that you think are distinct together all of a sudden create something new and how the film too, I think in the water part, when you, when I think it's Antoinette is saying all the kind of different words for water, um, how powerful that kind of like naming C comes together. So I guess um, a kind of comment question, maybe expand around the idea of naming or how, how these things kind of create power through, through naming them as such or putting two things that we think are distinct together. Um, 
into the same sentence or phrase. And is it true? I mean, I can't, I watched the film several times and so I can't even remember. Antoinette, does she ever introduce herself by name? Now that I'm thinking about naming in that way. Um, I think she's mentioned in the third person as Antoinette, but um, just thinking about narratives and how they're told. Now, riffing live. She's not, yeah, she, she, yeah, she's referred to in the third person. Yeah. I would also be interested in talking more about the trope of like the single individual going through the landscape as a way to like bring these scenes together. Um, I'm wondering if the artists can comment on that. And in this moment also where we've all felt so alienated and longed for collectivity, it, it in many ways like resonates with uh, how I think many, how we've been feeling, but it also like, there's something about it that just like leaves me wanting more. I like want to see some sort of collective emerge and maybe that's just my politics. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I was just, just to add to that. It's like, I, I agree with your politics, like the, with, the, with that impulse. I think I also jump back to that period of time when, I mean, like like Jordan was saying, it's like even the process of filming at that time was very unknown. I, I have to remember um, just how hard it was to know like what was safe as far as, as filming with multiple people at the same time. And I know that the film industry has figured that out at this point. Um, but I think it was, it also just like functioned kind of as a portrait of the the time in which some of the like most, most crucial um, shots were being made and most uh, central like storyboarding was happening is that um, I think for me at least, it was really impossible to even like understand how to get there at that point because it was such a, a, a I don't know what the word is. Um, sudden change in everyone's life that uh, I feel like it was, I feel like we're all still like processing what um, watching life change really quickly shift over a year and then like sort of watch some sort of end emerge, not now, but maybe, maybe years down the road. So I think it, for me, it functions as a portrait of the time, but I don't know, Jordan, if you can add more to that. Yeah, I mean, I think what I, uh, yeah, I mean, I hadn't thought about that, like, kind of classic, you know, it's almost glaringly obvious now to think about, you know, the the sublime, you know, the portraits of the individual, you know, in nature and that kind of, that uh, recurring, you know, visual image. I think it, yeah, I think ultimately it was mostly a product of the circumstance and the moment of producing, yeah, video work with actors, with people during COVID. But it, yeah, I mean, also, I don't know if I would have done it differently if it wasn't for COVID, um, because like something I find in my work, and I would say Coco's work as well, is this kind of persistent focus upon, yeah, some kind of interior feeling states and thoughts and that being a method like I'm thinking of your work from a couple years ago Coco with the speakers and the um in the yellow room sorry I don't have the title in my mind but um you know like Coco made this work with this 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 voice like narrating these um I'm not going to do it justice but but yeah like I don't know if I would actually do it differently um I, I love this kind of like I love the first person perspective. Um, you know, even less, even even like Jane Eyre, Los Angeles, I feel like there's already a lot of embodiment with 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 Antoinette being in the shots. Like it's almost like 
I feel like my instinct is almost to be more disembodied and more like a thought, a, a voice in your head or something. Um, yeah. Maybe and, and I think I need to go, go ahead. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think within that also, I just come back to the, I don't know, the, uh, the English trope of, of like the most personal being the most universal. Um, Cause I think there is some reality in, in understanding the way that like, understanding how the most like minute interactions with uh, environment and space uh, become ones that are more relatable to an audience than something that is is trying to uh, from the get-go you know capture what what some sort of like full-on communitarian um, universal might look like which may you know be the goal but yeah, like it yeah. needs to be community but we respond to individuals which is why names like George Floyd or Rihanna Taylor and having those videos associated have so much weight that then ignite the spark rather than we, you know, the statistics that are dire um, don't seem to kind of ignite people in the same way, even though that's what's, what's speaking. And I was thinking too about um, how the film shows both the kind of large scale big burns and the individual fire, either the one that you make while living out um, in the landscape to stay warm at night or the single candle that Aaron pointed to in his presentation as the kind of scale differences, same as the meme where, yeah, it's funny when he's funny slash ironic when the meme of the earth healing and we see one police car burning, but what if every single police car were burned and we abolished the police? Um, you know, those kind of scale differences um, are actually, I feel like really productive spaces. Um, just a comment. I have one other question maybe, and then if anyone in the audience has questions, please jump in. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about sound because we're going back now to the medium of film and what it affords. And obviously there's a soundtrack in addition to the narrative. And every time I watch the film, one of the moments that always strikes me is when it when you transition to the large fire burning and this like really upbeat like techno music. Um, and the music feels like uplifting and like speedy and hip. And then of course it's like a scene of vast landscapes burning. Um, so I don't know if you could think Maybe Jordan and Coco, you could share a little bit about kind of that um, decision and the kind of soundscape that we hear in the film and, and Aaron Coco, uh, Aaron and Marvel, if you have any um, other reactions to thinking about sound um, as something that comes through in film, doesn't come through as the same way, but something, at least to me, thinking about the Watts riots and et cetera, bring up a kind of internal soundscape, even though the images are just two-dimensional. Coco made that techno music. <laughs> yeah, that's my track. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's a complicated gesture. Um, in some ways, I felt like that was an appropriate move. I mean, I mean, we had we had had conversations about it, um, but I don't know if we would ever pin it as some sort of like one to one here's what that means or something. I think that uh, understanding how the language of, of uh, I mean, that that functions as a sort of like throbbing techno um, club space uh, that it just felt appropriate as far as the affect um, that I think that we are maybe approaching this, this tension. Um, I think those are tense scenes. Um, and um, maybe you have some more thoughts about it, Jojo. I mean, I think what you said, it's like, it's on one hand, it's kind of a, it's kind of a gesture of generosity to the viewer, which is to be like, okay, you've sat quietly and you've listened to these deep innermost thoughts and now you're gonna get a bit of a break and you can enjoy a bit of music. You know what I mean? It's almost, it's part of, you know, it's part of the language of filmmaking, you know, where you build up emotions and then you bring them down. And so I, I would say it's more so a device to push forward the, the feeling, yeah, like the affect of, of the work um, rather than, you know, and it's funny because I, I, that was, 
that's also something like I said earlier about like forcing myself to let something that's also me forcing myself to be like okay well maybe I should be less severe on my audience which is because I you know I studied video art in you know not I never went to cinema school like I only studied video and in, in, in an art context which is video art is often so severe and you don't get a break like you're just like okay you're gonna watch this still for 20 minutes you know what I mean um so that was me kind of letting myself try something new I, I would say but um I, it, was, it was somewhat fraught it was fraught I also think just to kind of um broaden the scope from the immediate of what's on the screen and the sound that's happening it's like I also just think of what like dance spaces mean for queer community and um you know what what like that as a different type of release also functions as like that can also just be in, also really healing like i feel like i usually talk about when i'm like vibing with friends about like utopic futures or something it's like something without a dance club like that's not a future that i want you know yeah I can't help but think of burn baby burn again as this like rallying cry for the Watts rebellion and then a disco anthem and um, bringing that out as a parallel in this discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, yeah, and also thinking about the, the sound still and thinking about the earlier conversation on rage and um, what Coco just said about release as well. Um, it's interesting to me in thinking back about the film that the rage from Antoinette feels very subdued and but in like a in a building way and the rage isn't released through her actions but it's released through the wildfire and so there's like there's an interesting connection I think between you know and I, maybe this is too literal, um, but I'm just going to say it anyway, between, you know, Antoinette and the, the wildfires and the rage that can't be expressed perhaps by oneself is kind of seen in this action of uh, uncontrolled uh, burn. And so I don't know if that's something um, that either artist wants to, you know, expand on, but um, yeah, the the concept of rage, I think, is interesting because it's also what the film starts out with, right? Um, but there's also like, there's a calmingness to, to that rage. I felt very calm when, when watching the film, especially when during the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the affect of delivery is very kind of even toned and matter of fact, even though the subject of what's being talked about is nothing but uh, and that rage and all these fiery emotions come to the fore. Definitely. Well, I want to invite the audience if you have any questions, please chime in. I think we'll, we could have many more discussions around this, but as a way of kind of closing, um, I just wanted to maybe ask everyone to share what they're thinking about or what you're working on next um, in this stage or what you're most excited about going forward, just a little short something as a way to thank everyone and say goodbye. I can start in just saying that I'm still relatively new to LA. So I'm appreciating this conversation about LA as a site with all these rich and complex histories and um, taking that forward as I continue to do work in LA. Coco and I are working on an exhibition in uh, September in San Francisco. That's kind of loosely about this year, 536, which was apparently the worst year ever when the sun was blotted out for two years. And um, that's our starting theme. So it's gonna be good, I think. Coco. Um, oh yeah, and one one sort of I don't know if I can tie this into being relevant, but five thirty six we were we were um, when we were looking at some of those uh, historical year references and and 
kind of trying to like defamiliarize a, a sort of longer arc history uh, with what um, is at the, the front of our mind right now. Uh, we were introduced to this history of uh, vulgar era, which I think in the 16th century era vulgaris, um, the Latin root also just means common. Uh, so it is the term for common era, um, but then has this sort of like double entendre of, of like thinking about like the time that we live in as being common and vulgar at the same time. So that is one other jumping off point of this new work that we're, we're um, embarking on. So something that I'm still interested in. Um, I'm really excited to see, oh, sorry, did I cut someone off? To mm -hmm. see, to see um, new and old friends from different parts of my life and in this space. And it makes me really excited to um, connect and reconnect and work together um, on, the, on these like shared interests. But currently the thing I'm working on that I'm excited about is um, a history of light shows and the forest and acid tests in Santa Cruz. Um, and I'm here, curious to hear what Aaron's working on. Uh, every, everything else that you all are working on sounds really fascinating, um, and it, it was really an honor to be here to think through this uh, video work with all of you today, um, primarily because I am continuing to think about kind of futurities as based in land, um, very broadly speaking. Uh, and so I'm working on my dissertation prospectus right now, defending at the end of the month, and that's basically what it's about. So. Uh, this was really, uh, really fun. Great, awesome. Thanks, everyone. And thanks to our devoted attendees for listening to us chat about this great film. Please share it with your friends. It'll be up through May 9th. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.